Good evening, everybody. I'm happy to start the presentation on behalf of Madhu and me. It should be ladies first. But given the sequence of the topics we have, I thought I'll start. Uh, both of us are based in the School of Engineering at RMIT. So it's a bit different from biomedical research, you would think. But a lot of our applications sit across disciplines. We make devices for physics. We make devices for biology. We make devices for communication technologies. And often we are told uh, engineering is very dry and boring. So we always like to introduce our group using this. So we work, I'll say, mainly around materials engineering. So where we work at the atomic scale, manipulate materials properties, and then harness them in the form of devices. So we start right from fundamental science and atomic scale engineering into device packaging, and then apply it to different technologies. We make artificial memory technology, which I'm going to talk about, wearable electronics, which Madhu is going to talk about, and we do a lot of high-speed communication and high-speed electronic technology, which I'm not going to cover in this context. Most of our work is done in semiconductor standard clean rooms. So very different from medical clean rooms, where you isolate yourself from the room. In a semiconductor clean room, you're protecting the room from the person. We are the source of contamination. So we wear full-length bunny suits and handle most of our samples. So this facility is in the RMIT City campus in a, on the top level of a heritage-listed building. Uh, quite unique in terms of how we got it in there. If any of you want to visit, uh, please get in touch, and we'll be happy to give you a tour. It's a centralized facility, which is open to all RMIT researchers. And over the last few years, we've had lots of technology coming out of this facility in the biomedical space. We have ingestible capsules which measure gut health to correlate the gut microbiome to uh, disorders. So that's actually a licensed technology with a Melbourne-based company, Atmo Biosciences. It was licensed about five months back for $4.5 million from RMIT. Similarly, there are miniaturized nebulizers to deliver targeted lung cancer treatment for lung cancer cells. So lots of different technologies in that space. So the one I'm going to talk to you about is how are we trying to learn lessons from biology and apply it in electronics. And in electronics, we handle data. All of us are carrying lots of data around us. Irrespective of the discipline, everything's become data centric. And still, in electronics, most of the data is zeros and ones. It is black and white. But nothing in how we process memory is ever black and white. We remember complex things. When we learn something new, we don't erase what's there. We either augment what we know, modify what we know. And so the standard electronics where you constantly keep rewriting is not realistic in terms of biological systems. So we were, it will be very far from what a medical expert would think. I'm giving you the engineering perspective of how we think a human brain and systems work. And that's where we really need convergence, as this network talks about. We come from one end of the spectrum. Medical researchers have different expertise. And hopefully, we can bridge all these gaps as we go forward. So we look at the brain transporting information in the form of ions. So every signal in the brain is an electrical impulse, which occurs at the synaptic cleft. So between two synapses, ionic transport happens. The speed of the ionic transport, the intensity of the ionic transport, in some, as an example, controls our motor function. If I were to pick up my cup of water, the brain is sending a signal to my hand to do so. If it were a hot mug, I'm going to react strongly. This type of stimuli, the speed, the nature of it is different. And we are trying to replicate such function on a chip. So if you focus on it as a single synapse, which we're trying to make in electronics, the two edges would actually be metal, so conductors. The cleft is a medium which transports ions or has vacancy states which move around. So in an electronic context, it's a metal, an oxide, or an insulator, and another metal. And based on the signals we apply between the two metals, we can move ions around in an oxide material. I'll get Madhu to pass around some samples. These essentially just have arrays of these memories. Uh, they are pretty big in these examples. Each of these are about 20 micrometer by 20 micrometer. The reality is the ones we make will be significantly small, usually. This is just for visualization. One of them has a single segment, which has, I think, about uh, 36, while the other is half a silicon wafer. 
So what do we do in these cases? I was talking to you about the oxides. So most oxides are essentially glasses. And I like using this image because of the stained glass window. As you introduce impurities or change the properties, glasses take on different colors in this case, or they have different electronic properties. So all the devices we carry around have glass panels, on the top of which is a coating which is conductive or insulating, which you touch, changes properties, and that's how your touch screen works. And these layers are generally about 100 nanometers thick, so 1,000 times thinner than an average human hair. And if you look at these atoms in these glasses, they could be amorphous, so arranged in random order. They could be crystalline in a very systematic periodic structure. What we go and do is replace some of these atoms. And all glasses have oxygen atoms in them because they are oxides. And we actually remove some of these oxygen atoms. So we create vacancies. And once you have vacancies under an electric field, you can move them around, which becomes like ionic transport. So where does this fit in electronics? So most people, even if you think a little bit back to any engineering or electronics you know, you would have heard of resistors, capacitors, inductors. Those form standard parts of any circuit. But in nature, everything has symmetry. So we've had resistors, capacitors, inductors. They're sold in the market. They've been made forever. But there was always this fourth missing element. It was theoretically, mathematically predicted in the 1970s. But with advances in nanotechnology, the first experimental demonstration happened in 2007 out of HP research labs in the US. And all that they managed to do is shrink the size of the circuit to nanoscale and control oxygen transport in the oxide. And the term memristor is essentially the concatenation of memory and resistor. You store information in the form of resistance. So obviously, trying to keep the talk a bit general, I'm not going to go into the extreme detail of the techniques. And so I'll explain any graphs you see as simply as I can, but feel free to ask questions. So when we grow these oxides, I told you all the transport of the ionic behavior happens due to deficiencies or missing oxygen atoms. So the oxide we use is strontium titanium oxide, which is 60% oxygen. So when we grow it, so what you see here is the oxygen concentration. When we grow it, we have about 56.5%. So this is the thickness of the film. This is oxygen concentration. Being stoichiometric would be 60% we have about 56.5%. And then once we apply an electric field through the material, we actually get a profile of oxygen vacancies. It's not uniformly distributed anymore. It has a non-uniform distribution. So that's sort of schematically shown here. It was random. Once you apply an electric field, you get a non-uniform distribution of the oxygen vacancies. And as you apply an electric field, the oxygen vacancies get either attracted to an electrode or repelled from the electrode. And so you, based on the strength of your electric field, you can move the vacancies through the material. So now these vacancies are electrical conductors. So that means if the vacancies connect the top and the bottom electrode, you'll have very low resistance because current can flow through. But if you suck all the vacancies to one end, most of your material is an insulator. Current cannot go through. You get high resistance. You leave them in between. You have low resistance and high resistance combined. So you can have multiple resistance states which sort of becomes the foundation of not being digital anymore, not 0 and 1. You can have more complex memory states. So initially, as we were characterizing this material, we wanted to know if we can store information in it, how small can we go? And what we found by probing at the nanoscale down to each element with switches, we can actually do switching at the scale of 2 nanometers. So that means we can actually pack the memory in really high density. And this shows the ability to store many states. So I was telling you, electronics, you'd have one low resistance state and one high resistance state. So that would be your one, and this would be your zero. But here, based on how you apply a field and how you distribute the vacancies, you can have multiple states in between. And if you see, this is a logarithmic scale. Um, so you actually have lots of room to fit more. As they often say in nanotechnology, there's plenty of room at the bottom. So this is eight examples. We've done up to 32 states in our lab, but the rest of it is just essentially programming and management. The reason is why is this technology not used right away is obviously all 
actual software programming is still based on zeros and ones. And so that has to again converge in using analog programming to be able to capitalize on this technology. So coming to the biological aspects, given we know zero biology, we rely on literature. We looked at a lot of literature data in terms of how pulsing ionic transport happens at the synaptic interface. So in these graphs, the reddish data is based on literature. The blue is from our electronic devices. So if you again consider two electrodes, which are the two synapses, the presynaptic and the postsynaptic points, your oxide with the vacancies is your essentially the synaptic cleft. We apply pulses. So at the first, second, and the first synapse, or the second, the first, and the second. And we pulse it based on conditions actually given in literature, in biological tests. And as you can see, in most of the cases, the electronic system is about within 10% of the biological system. So that was sort of the preliminary one case of where can we actually have uh, spike timing dependent plasticity in these artificial memory systems? Can you control and program the weight and intensity of these signals? So that was done electronically by your probing. Given we also make devices which are light activated, there's a lot of interest in optogenetics and light based storage, we were using light sources to actually program memory. So based on the wavelength of light, so these are ultraviolet light, uh, UVB, 280 nanometers, we, and the pulse and the weight of it, we can actually create either short term memory or long term memory in these materials. And taking it a bit further, if you use two different wavelengths, so 365 nanometer, which is UVA, 280 nanometer, which is UVB, you can actually create logic circuits. So based on which light is exposed and what is pulsed, you can create functionality. So that's input A and B. And as you can see, this is a XOR function, where only when one of them is active, you get opposite pulses, positive or negative. And this is an OR function, when both are zero, you get no signal. For one of them being active, you get this intensity. Both are active, it's double the intensity. And we can actually put these together and make really complex uh, logic functions. In this particular case, the example uh, material used is called black phosphorus. So it's a layered atomic crystal, similar to graphene, which is really popular. Uh, it's an interesting material, which if you're exposed to air, it'll get blisters and get damaged. So when you actually make devices, you need to know conditions to protect it. So the reason we were looking at it initially, obviously, is if you make your memory devices really small, you have high density memory, you can fit more information, we need to store more information. So if you just simply look at the example of going analog, in the same footprint, if you can show eight states or 16 states, your USB drive immediately has more capacity. You don't have to do anything fancy, you change that material and program accordingly, you increase capacity. The longer term thing, which we are trying to do, is by replicating more and more brain functionality, can we actually put brain functionality on a chip? Can we create artificial intelligence hardware? And we've been actually doing a lot of demonstration in that area about recognizing images, recognizing patterns, and storing them. The other extreme would be, can you put a chip in the brain? If we come across neurological disorders, can we replicate that on a chip, try and understand them more, and try and augment brain function? And on that note, I'll hand over to Madhu for the second half of the talk. So the second half of the talk is going to be a bit different because I'm going to be talking more about stretchable materials. Why stretchable materials? Why did we start doing this? That's something I'll try and explain in the motivation for this work. So before I launch off into you know, futuristic technology, I thought I'll give you a little bit of history of what wearable technology looks like. Now, most people are familiar with wearable technology. It is something which is taking the market by storm. But a lot of focus is more on current technology. But if you look at the wearable technology in the true essence of the word, you would realize the history is actually quite long. It's basically any technology which can be worn on the body. So the calculator watches from back in the 70s, you know, which big clunky watches which had a calculator functionality on them or the Sony Walkman, you know, which, which allowed you to carry your entertainment no matter where you went. All of these are examples of wearable technology. A lot of these focused on more of entertainment factor, but there are a few key devices in there which have a lot of important functionality as well. Pacemakers for one, for quite a few people, that's a very, very integral part of life. 
as also as the hearing aid, which as a, as a concept existed for a very long time, but then became a reality in the 80s. But one thing which was in common with all those other things which were there in the first slide was the fact that most of them are still clunky. They are not, they're not wearable, even though you call them wearable technology. They are wearable, but they're still clunky. Unfortunately, a lot of them are still breakable. Most of you might have the experience of dropping some of these devices, and they never quite work the same way again. So for us, the beginning for stretchable electronics was trying to take electronics as we knew them and try and render them stretchable. Now, one way of approaching stretchable electronics for a lot of groups has been, shall we make a new set of materials which can be stretchable? Because one could quite, uh, quite not understand whether current, techno current technology as it stands, can you actually render that stretchable? Or do we need to have a new class of materials which we need to render stretchable? So this was something which we did back in 2013. We just took gold electrode materials. Now gold is an electrode material which is used quite often in electronics because it's a noble met metal. It doesn't oxidize very easily, which means you know the lifetime of the electronic device which is made out of gold is actually quite good. So we took gold, we put them on a contact lens like polymeric material. It's very similar to the samples which are being passed around. And we tried to stretch it to see what exactly happens. So this was work which we did back in 2012, 2013. But it's not just us. The field pretty much started with this kind of work, trying to take a metal and trying to render it stretchable. So as you can see over there, we managed to make gold thin films stick onto a plasticky or a polymery substrate. And you can flex it or you can bend it. You don't strain it as much, but you still retain a bit of its functionality. So when we looked at this, we thought, now how about we take those oxide materials, which Sharath referred to in his presentation, and try and render them stretchable instead. Gold is nice, it's a conductor, but you don't get much functionality out of it besides the fact that it's actually conducting, conducting some kind of electricity. Now there are some technological challenges when obviously when it comes to taking a very brittle material like oxide and trying to render it stretchable. Current electronics, as we know, stands like this. But what also lies within these electronics is many, many layers of oxide materials. So every electronic device which you have has numerous layers of oxide materials or other functional materials within them, which is what imparts its functionality to it. Oxides, as you saw in Sharad's slides, are extremely brittle. So they're pretty much like glass. And what we wanted to do was take these materials and put them on a stretchable polymer, a bit like a contact lens type material, but try and see if you can actually stretch it. It's not a very intuitive thing, trying to take oxides and trying to render them stretchable. But we thought if you can crack this technological challenge, you open up a plethora of applications which we never really thought was possible. What we managed to develop was a transfer process. Now, the secret behind this is the fact that platinum does not stick to silicon. Now, platinum is used very often, again, in electronics industry, again, because of the fact it's a noble metal. And generally, for platinum to attach itself to silicon, which is, again, the workhorse of the electronics industry, you use an addition layer like titanium or chromium or titanium dioxide in the middle. What we did, or rather what my student didn't do for one of the times, was he forgot the addition material. So he kind of put the platinum on the silicon, and, once, and we realized that once you actually have a stretchable polymer material on top of it and peel it off, the entire layer just comes off with it. So we realized that this could be used to actually develop a transfer process. So you have the silicon, the silicon substrate, which you always have for electronics. You put down the platinum on it. You put down your oxide material on top of it. You do what you normally do in microfabrication or nanofabrication, as you normally realize electronic devices. And towards the end, you put down the polymer layer and peel it off. And when that happens, because the platinum is not stuck to the silicon, the whole thing just comes off the silicon substrate. And that's what we managed to realize. Electronics which look a bit like that. They're transparent, they're stretchable, and they still have a lot of functionality within them. And what we actually found was we could actually stretch this. We could stretch it to up to around 12 or 15% and it still retained its functionality. This was again a bit counterintuitive because we couldn't quite understand how we managed to make a brittle metallic oxide stretch to this extent. We took a look at it under the electron microscope and it looks pretty much like what you see in the middle image over there. It kind of reminded us of the geological plates which make up the Earth's crust, so we call it microtectonics. So as you can see over there, the oxide material is no longer a thin layer. It's actually structured in the form of overlapping plates. And that kind of then made us understand if you stretch it, essentially it's the plates moving on, sliding one on top of each other until they lost electrical contact when you apply a little too much strain. And once you released it back, again it went back and slid on top of each other again, and once again rendered itself functional. The other beauty about this 
was the beauty of using micro and nanotechnology. If we didn't pattern these films and transfer them over as, as they were, as large area of films as I referred to it in the slide, we could stretch them to up to around 5%. If we micro pattern them and render them into micro sized features, micron being one thousandth of a millimeter, we found that we could stretch it to up to, on, up to around 15 percent. Nano pattern it, so you're going now a thousand times smaller than a micron, really, really tiny features, you could stretch them up to around 20 percent. Now, 20 or 25 percent is quite important because that's the stretchability of your skin. So, if you're ever looking to have you know, practical applications where you're putting electronics on your skin, you would like it to strain or stretch up to around 20%. Now why this happened was just because you're trying to embed more of the oxide within the polymer material. So it's a polymer which sees most of the strain and it keeps the oxide functional for longer. We did this and then we thought, okay, now how can we actually use this in a practical manner? One thing was some of the oxides which we used are actually quite sensitive to various gases. So you might have dangerous gases like hydrogen, which are odorless and colorless, which are there, but you would not actually know it, but it's extremely dangerous. Or there are gases like nitrogen dioxide, which is quite commonly seen in polluted countries. So the idea of having a gas sensor, which you can wear on your skin or wear on clothes, which can actually sense the amount of dangerous gases which are present, was something which we realized. Now a lot of opt, uh, oxide materials also have optical properties, like titanium dioxide, which actually changes the way when it interacts with light, it changes its properties. So the idea of having a Harry Potter-like invisibility cloak becomes a little bit closer to reality. We kind of create a nano version of it, so we need to you know, multiply it many, many, many times before you create what's, what you see over the image over there. But then it's a futuristic optical technology which looks quite promising. UV, uh, I don't have to talk to, uh, talk to you about UV in the sense Australia is literally skin cancer capital. So the idea of having a sensor on your skin which alerts you to the amount of UV exposure you might have on a day-to-day -day basis is again a wearable sensor technology which we can look at. Now UV has two components, UVA and UVB, and they affect our skin a bit differently. And these oxides can be made sensitive to different regimes of UV, and therefore you can individually probe the amount of UV you're actually exposing yourself to. If you Google the word wearable technology, you'll get an image which is kind of looking similar to that image over there. So what that shows you is the possibilities are a bit endless. You can imagine them on your skin, you can imagine them on your clothes, tracking the environment or tracking your, your body. And it's just that, it's just that the technology has endless possibilities. which kind of made it hard for us to actually understand what we wanted to focus on, because what we almost had was a platform technology which we could take and run in any particular direction. This is where industry comes in and kind of you know, gives us questions which, for which we aim to provide solutions. So the next few slides, I'll talk to you a little bit about the technologies where we're working actively with industry and trying to actually partner with them to take our products out from the lab into the real life. So this was, uh, with the UV sensor work, this was a Johnson & Johnson quick fire challenge which our team won late last year. So this was actually funded by the Victorian state government and they were quite keen on using our UV sensors work and pushing them a little closer towards commercialization. So what we're doing is we're working with the company and trying to develop a data logger device to, to render them truly more wireless. So the sensor is, is the one which you see over there. We're trying to make sure that it picks up the data of UV and, it, and actually sends it in a sensible format to your mobile phone so you can actually get data which is more valuable and which, which is more understandable than just squiggly lines. So that's the kind of data you get. You can actually see that the sensor is, uh, the, um, the resistance or the properties of the sensor changes every time it's exposed to UV. And that is then processed by the mobile phone, and hopefully it'll give you the data in terms of telling you you've had too much UV exposure, go and put on more sunscreen, or you know you can still afford to get a little more just so that you can get more vitamin D done for the day. One other project which we're also working on is again an industry-driven project. So it's by a company called ESN Nanotech. Now this is where it starts looking into using these oxide-based sensors to do biomarker analysis. Now there are biomarkers in various body fluids which actually kind of indicate the early onset of cardiovascular disease or stroke. So this was something which ESN Nanotech was trying to develop a disposable wearable device to actually probe. So what we're doing with them is trying to look into the concentration of IL-6 and C-reactive protein, two of the most prominent biomarkers which are present in sweat or in saliva, which indicate the early onset of cardiovascular disease or stroke. 
So as you can see, we've actually been able to develop sensors which can pick up the levels of IL-6 or CD active protein. It can even pick up levels 1,000 times which is lower than what's present normally in sweat or saliva. So this is again an active project which we just started working with the company. A third example is more of you know, developing non-invasive sensors for with, to incorporate within bedding for aged care. So this was a project which was funded last year as a CRCP project. It has two industry partners, so Sleep Tight, who is more of the technology arm, and Sleep Easy, who are the manufacturing partner. So the idea behind this was to try and see if we can actually have sensors incorporated within bedding products, which are then rolled out into the aged care sector to try and monitor whether a person is in bed or not in bed. This very ambitious project actually has three phases. Phase one being detecting the presence of a person in bed, in bed or not in bed. Phase two being actually identifying if is the person breathing or not. And phase three, the actually any heart rate measurements of the person. It's challenging because you're trying to do it in a non-contact manner with the person. It's also challenging because you're trying to um, you know, we're trying to take our sensors, which are more micro and nano in nature, and trying to roll them out across an entire mattress. But it's an interesting project because, as you can see, it's, it kind of lends a lot of dignity and respect for people within the aged care sector. The idea of a nurse having the entire heads-up display, which kind of gives them clearly the indication of, is a person in bed or not in bed, it kind of makes the monitoring within aged care sectors a little better. So this slide kind of uh, highlights a little bit of the challenges which we face. So these are very similar to the labs which Sharath showed you at the beginning of the, of the presentation. So the micro nano research facility has all the equipment and has all the cutting edge technology which is there to actually for us to develop these fundamental breakthroughs. But in reality, a lot of the fundamental breakthroughs which we develop in such labs in a much more contained atmosphere are the ones which we need to bring out into real life situations. And that's where the challenges are, which, which, are, which is what we're working in towards actively. So to go from micro and nano to more macro, as well as to go from contained atmospheres into real life situations. It's an interesting challenge and an interesting space to be in. And it's definitely very motivating to actually see some of the, te the technology which you develop in the lab to actually make its way out into the real world. Before I finish up, I thought I'll just bring it back to this slide, just to remind you of you know, where we started off at. So as we, we work on materials at a micro and nano scale, but as you can see, a lot of the applications which this technology has is quite macro scale. It can impact life now quite readily and can also will continue to impact life for many, many years to come. Many of the projects like the brain on the chip or the chip on the brain, it's early days, but we need to start now to make the technology happen in 30 or 40 years time. And then there are the technologies which are described in the stretchable space, which could hit the market as early as next year. The beauty about working in this kind of a technology is it also allows us to work at the intersection of many of these fields. So using the ultra thin novel materials to understand brain like functionality or creating stretchable artificial memory or brain. Those are the kind of, you know, the cross functional things which we can actually realize from working in this group. Before we finish up a uh, slide to actually thank the people, uh, it's not just a two people show. It's a young, vibrant research group who work with us, strongly motivated PhD students and postdocs. Um, beautiful to see a gender balanced uh, group in engineering, which is actually quite rare. And we're extremely proud to lead this very young group. And also to show that scientists have a life that's us not in the lab, actually outside having an escape room experience last year. So we do get out of the lab. And also to thank our main funding bodies, the Australian Research Council, which funded us really early in our careers to actually establish an independent group and to start working quite efficiently and independently. More recently, the Cooperative Research Centers Program, which funds our wonderful collaboration with Sleep Tight and Sleep Easy. And the also the Victorian State Government, which has been a constant support through Westkey Fellowships for us, or more recently through the UV sensor work. And that's us. Thank you very much. I have two questions, one each to the two speakers, to keep the gender balance. First question, with the non-binary logic that you have developed, would it be a suitable element to do direct hardware uh, processing of fuzzy logic functions? That's one. And the second question is, for the, in the aged care sector, 
you have described at least three possibilities of whether the person is in bed or not, whether the person is uh, uh, breathing. breathing or not, and whether the heartbeat is going. Maybe there is another application, and that is development of sores yes. from people who are lying around. So if you could offer more comments, thank you. In terms of the hardware for fuzzy logic, which it is sort of uh, one of the motivations of developing this technology. Because digital electronics does not cover any complex mathematics, any complex logic. And so we really need analog functionality. And so that's why I alluded to it as being the hardware for artificial intelligence. So currently, all AI platforms are based on code. Coding intensive machine learning happens on digital logic platforms, which is you're using the energy which powers 30,000 homes to run a supercomputer, while our brain needs a banana. So what are the lessons we can draw in terms of energy efficiency is the core of this technology. In terms of your question on aged care, it's amazing. The, like I said, you know, the, every time I come and present to an audience like this, I keep getting new ideas for that technology. And this was something which someone recently brought up. The idea of, you know, that you cannot be in the same posture this, all the time and need to keep changing posture just for the, uh, being alert, alert to the fact that bed sores can develop. So that is something which this technology can potentially cover because what we're looking at is not whether there's a weight present in the bed, but actually the posture or the distribution of weight across the surface of the bed. So yes, we would know if the person's you know, in the same posture for very long, and that could be something we could alert the nurse to as well. And one of the critical things we are looking at in that space is also falls. Mm -hmm. So a person being in bed, breathing is good, but uh, most of the injuries in the aged care sector are when people leave the bed to use the restroom at night, have a fall, and don't return to bed in time. So monitoring such things so that you can check at the right time and have alerts, that sort of systems. Um, yes, I've got a question for the first speaker. Um, your multi-level um, logic devices, um, the electronics computer industry or digital industry, they could have always uh, have done it this way. I remember um, in, in the 1970s, you had TTL logic circuits. They went from 0 to 5 volts and others that went from 0 to minus 5 volts. So, you know, you've got a factor of 2 there already. And you can go from, you know, from 0 to 5, to 10, 15, etc. And you have, you, you, you sort of increase the um, level of um, uh, detection that way. But I think the reason why the um, digital electronics industry never went down that path, which would have been qu quite feasible, you know, even 40 years ago, was um, complexity. It's very simple to deal with, with ones and zeros, you know, northern five volts rather than various stages in between. And also when it comes to transmission, uh, it's very easy to transmit ones and zeros through, you know, modulated frequencies. And also the other thing you have to take into account is when you introduce noise into the picture, uh, a spike can get you from 0 to 1, not, not to 5 volts, but if you have multi-level uh, devices or multi-level segments, a noise spike can go from 0 to 5 volts to 10, 15. You've got no idea. It's, so it's more difficult to, to track. So um, I understand, I, I take what you say, that you know, this is more, this, you, can, you can pack more information in, in that sort of system. But if you, if you just have ones and, ones and zeros, and if the speed is fast enough, like we're in the gigahertz now, you really don't need such multi-level complexity, uh, especially with the extra effort you have to put in, in order to get something that's better or equivalent. Okay? Um, I guess there's two parts uh, to respond to that. One is, if you're just talking about uh, computation, you're not going to compete with digital in the near future because that, that has to be a significant shift. But if you're looking at uh, circuits for fuzzy logic and artificial intelligence, uh, the zeros and ones really don't cut it. The second aspect is um, the leakage currents. So when you're looking at voltage-based division logic, every time you go up in voltage, your leakage current increases, so you consume more energy. Uh, these circuits are designed to actually have almost zero leakage, and so you work off resistance levels, but the same voltage. So your energy consumption is completely minimized. When your device is off, there's no drain on your battery. So yes, there are, the digital technology is very mature, 
I, this would never be a replacement for it, but for certain functionality, you need the analog, uh, the power of the analog system or the complexity the analog offers. And the simplest one is the memory storage. Like I said, if you're trying to look at a system which augments its learning, the digital system cannot do that because it's going to erase what it has. I'm not trying to be negative here, but I'm just Fine. trying to tell you. I mean, if, I, if I don't tell you, I'm sure someone else will eventually. Absolutely. But um, your stretchable um, electronic devices, um, yes, it's very good. However, uh, given that the, um, you can pack uh, a large number of electronic devices on a very small area now, uh, you can still uh, maintain the, what you're trying to do with a glass or ceramic um, uh, chip to store your um, active devices on, whether it be sensors or processing, whatever, and just have stretchable connections in between, um, which would be much easier uh, than to have the actual um, printable electronics themselves stretchable. So hard soft integration is basically what you're talking about, having hard components but integrated with the soft stretchable polymer. Sure, that's one way to go for that for sure, but this offers you the conformal nature which you know that wouldn't offer you in some sense. So if you're thinking of a going forward where you're trying to put a sensor on your skin, you're trying to actually collect sweat from the skin at the same time and carry out the functionality, the analysis of biomarkers and things like that, you ideally need it to be this kind of a platform. It's not going to be, you know, that it's not that easy having a harder platform in some sense doing that. And going even one step further, where you're thinking of you know, biosolvable electronics or putting electronics within the body, this biocompatibility again has an added advantage towards that. But we're also talking about you know, putting things within uh, clothes or putting them on uh, bedding products like with the uh, sleep tight technology. Once again, the idea is not just stretchability, but also it being conformal, which unfortunately the hard soft doesn't always offer you. So not all applications needed to go down this path, but for some applications, this is definitely the better way forward. I have a couple of questions. You used the, what I understand, the inorganic materials to produce these ones. Do you have plan to use the organic materials for the future, like the store, especially for memory storing in DNAs? Um, uh, two parts to the answer. There are lots of researchers who work on organic materials. So we are not claiming to do everything. Um, the reason we stick to inorganic is that's our strength and expertise. We know to really control them, so we stay within our boundaries of expertise. The second part is um, the reality is inorganic materials are much more stable. Uh, organic materials age, they are very sensitive to moisture, their lifetime is affected by exposure to light, exposure to heat. So uh, given we are looking at devices which people would wear long term, a lot of the variables we do we're trying to make them completely battery free. You stick a UV sensor on a surface, when you want to power it up, you power it up with a reader, get data out of it. So we wanted to be able to sit on any window, a vehicle in the field, etc. So for that reason, we avoid the organics, except for the polymer backbone which supports our inorganic electronics. Maybe not now, maybe in the future after 10 or 20 years, because the organic materials have much capacity to keep the data more, well, uh, multi multifolds. Uh, um, something maybe it's possible to do it because I, I read the some uh, articles that there's some few research groups are working on the uh, DNA structures to keep more memories like the 10,000 or f um, maybe more multiple folds to keep the data. Yeah, I think the organics will have whole promise but I'll still say there are two negatives. One, they're still uh, easily degradable and two is how do you scale them up? Scaling up is going to be a big problem. The organics cost a lot while these inorganic materials you can coat on windows in a single run. So again, from a technology side of it, there's a big gap. So I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm sure there are lots of people putting in effort in that space. Hi. Um, the, one of the bigger sections of uh, electronics really is power supplies and how to you bring energy to the circuits. What's your view of uh, how will you interface these potential bananas into, you know, stretchable electronics and on the scale of, of brain and so on. Are there any stretchable batteries? <coughs> what What's the uh, your view there? What What's happening um, in, with the technology? I think one of the big bids for uh, us in terms of an integrated device is how do you take all these stretchable components? Like Madhu said, because we work at the intersection, 
we can make stretchable memories, we can make stretchable sensors, we can make stretchable transistors or electronics. How do you bring them together, power them and keep them going? Um, batteries are always one of the biggest challenges in any device. So we, for most of them, we look at actually near field communication technology. So similar to what's in your pay pass, pay wave cards. So when you're in the proximity of a reader, the antenna powers it, your circuit operates. And so that gives your devices or sensors a lot of shelf life. You make a lot of them, leave them, you power them when you're using them. But there are uh, flexible thin film batteries and there the organics come in. Uh, there are a lot of organic thin film batteries with lithium ions in them. So there's a separate technology. Most of these still need hard soft integration like Madhu said, because they're still packaged in hard circuits and the interface where you connect them to your stretchable ends up being the weak point of your device. So it's a bit like you having an adapter for a phone. The joint where it goes from soft to hard is always the weakness. And so uh, tackling that is still a problem. And obviously we don't do anything in the power electronics, the big scale side of it. We're gonna talk about the um, non-work kind of issues, the, the work-life balance, I guess. Now you have one child, how do you uh, um, manage your time? I mean, what's a typical day for you, typical work day? There is no typical work day, to be honest. Right. Okay. Um, what's an atypical work day? Okay. Um, so besides the research, we do a lot of other things as well. So we have a lot of leadership roles which we have across the university as well as external to the university, mm -hmm. some on an international scale as well. Um, so that's why, like I said, there's no typical uh, work day. What keeps us sane and uh, keeps us organized is a combined calendar, So, which, which we dedicatedly make sure we put in every of our appointments into. So in one look at it, we know who's, who's going to be picking up the child and who's not going to be able to do some things on certain days because either one, is, one of us is away. You mentioned you do these other activities. What's the reason for that? Why, why do you, it's a, it takes time and effort and you travel interstate to do this. Um, what, why do you do it? What's the benefit for you? I guess I'm just that kind of a person. I mean, to be honest, I've always been doing this ever since I started. After, just after I finished my PhD, I got an ARC uh, fellowship to continue on with my uh, research. But that was a time when um, I decided I wanted to do a little more than I had time on my hands. We hadn't, we had, didn't have our son yet, and we had time on our hands. And so my keen interest at that point was in the higher degrees by research space. So tr I started off as an early career research representative on the higher degrees by research committee. And I've slowly now made my way to being the associate dean for higher degrees by research on the same, on the first school of engineering. So that is something I was very passionate about because I just finished my experience as a PhD student. And I could see very obvious things which we could have done to ha make, the, make a better research environment in some sense. And this was a little bit of me giving back. The other space which I have a big passion in is uh, in the gender equity space. And again, this was something which I started doing only after I had a maternity break and came back and realized it's not as straightforward as can be. Things can, and there are small things which could be done to you know, make our experience a bit better. So that is something which I have a big interest in. So I started off the Women Researchers Network within RMIT. Um, I sit on the Athena Swan Committee for RMIT. I also recently sat in the expert working group for the Women in STEM Decadal Plan implementation and now on the implementation task force. I guess if I can add to that, uh, I guess most of us in research are in it because we feel there's a purpose. Um, otherwise, there are plenty of jobs out there. I, I don't think anyone's in it for the money. Um, so uh, I think everything we see there's a purpose, there's a problem to be solved, or when you've had an experience, you know what can be better, and you want to help the pipeline improve, so they don't face the same barriers. So I'm a person who readily complains, not, um, but I always uh, tell my vice chancellor, because I go to him with a lot of issues, I'll always come to you with a problem and its solution. Because it's easy to complain, but when you present a solution, people have to tell you why they can't do it that way. So that's my approach. And so I do policy work across the country and internationally. I meet members of parliament to change funding schemes for early mid-career researchers, um, target funding towards specific spaces. So yes, we do a lot more than research, but I guess when you have a good team who keep you motivated, you want the environment to be good for your team too, and everyone beyond that. Can we talk about the issue that most academics um, have to deal with, or all of them in fact, uh, you know, grant writing. I mean, how, how do things change when you start writing for 
you know, that grant period, which can last for months, okay? Um, and the chances of getting funding are, are slimmer every year. But so how do you, how does it affect your, your life? Because that's pretty intense, I know. Um, I don't think any of us find it fun. And the reality is probably 80% of the projects out there deserve to be funded. So we know it's all mm. a statistical lottery. Um, so I, in some of my advocacy work, I even talk about that in terms of reducing the size of the grants. For in many agencies, you write a three-pager to know whether you're in or out. And here we write 100-page NHMRC grants, 80-page ARC grants, and that's a single investigator. The more people you add on, the more you want to collaborate, the more complex your grants become. So it's not easy, but one thing we've realized is uh, recently, in the last two years, we've been fortunate to be on one of the other ends where we work with industry. You write a two-page pitch with deliverables, it's a go, you get 40,000 to start with and it works. You write another five pages, they give you 300,000 for a year, mm. which is the size of an ARC standard grant. So uh, it's certainly lesser motivation to write grants. Uh, we do help a lot of our younger researchers, right? Because it's still a learning process. You need to be able to write, make a cogent argument for whatever you need to be competitive. And so I'll, we use grant writing as a self-assessment tool to plan projects, not for the funding. And do you do that? Sorry, Madhu, do you want to say something? Do you want to add? I think we usually play with the numbers, right? I mean, I know the success rate is 20 percent. What we end up doing, so that we look happy at the end of the day, is write uh, five grants so that at least one of them gets up. Unfortunate, but true. At least you're left smiling at the end of the day. So, do you take work home? I, I guess you do. I mean, you you uh, you spend time with uh, with the family and relax. And who goes to the office first? Who uh, who, who makes a dash for the home office? What's office? Um, <laughs> so I always laugh about the work-life balance because um, if you really enjoy what you do, there's no work, there's no life. It's all one and the same. There are frustrations, but yeah, beyond that, I don't uh, see boundaries. And being a couple and running a research team together is a double-edged sword. We can talk home at work, we can talk work at home, so it really blends too much. But I, I think my nature is, I'll just say, I sleep less. No, I, I need 10 hours of sleep, so <laughs> I sleep more. Um, so how do you relax? What, what do you do to, to get away from, you know, the stress of, 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 of the lab? I think our son is, uh, forces us to do that, you know, he keeps us sane that way. Uh, we like travelling and he especially loves travelling and he's a good traveller. So I think that taking breaks away now and then, it's not really a break, we still check our emails, but uh, yeah, but that keeps us sane every now and then. Uh, I tend to read a lot, a lot of fiction because I don't know anything serious. I do enough reading at work. Um, I do tend to read a lot of science fiction too, because one of the things we always say in our group is, today's science fiction is tomorrow's reality. And that's what we want to make. So all these things we see have been there in movies 20 years ago. And we want to keep pushing the boundary. So I actually find science fiction inspires ideas. OK, look, thank you for that. Can we give uh, Madhu and Sharath a, a big round of applause for uh, sharing the work tonight. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for having us. And we wouldn't be here without our sponsors, so I thank the sponsors for their uh, ongoing contribution that make these events possible. Thank you. Good evening. We'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>